After the deaths of the Jesuit missionaries here in the 1640s, and after St. Cattery left the Mohawk Valley in the 1670s, history rolled on. By the time the American Revolution came in the 1770s and 1780s, and the Mohawks joined with the British, weren't they all surprised, the British and everyone who had allied themselves with them when the Patriots won the war against the British Empire. So the Mohawks lost their land here in the Valley of the Mohawks. By the late 1700s and into the early 1800s, homesteads, farms, more people moving into the valley, and the Erie Canal comes in the 1820s. More people, more trade, more mills, factories, everything is growing. The mid-1800s, the Jesuits started setting up parishes in the area. So we, we meet a man named uh, Father Joseph Loisance, who's stationed in what's now Troy, New York. And he has a fascination with his Jesuit history. And he's wondering, you know, where did these martyrdoms happen? So he said, no, I'm going to find out. And he hires, or he gets together a team of an archaeologist, a historian, um, different priests who are familiar with the area. So what they do is look at the Jesuit relations, which was, is an amazing body of literature and documentation, that the Jesuit missionaries documented everything that had happened in their individual missions every year sent it back to Europe, to their superiors. So the early settlements of New France and what happened here at Orysville is documented in the Jesuit relations, including St. Isaac Jogues' own writing. So they looked at this. They looked at how St. Isaac described the village, described the bend of the river, described another river coming in, which we know now to be Schoharie Creek, um, described the river, everything just kind of fit for here. So they decided this was the place. There was a farmer who had owned, his family had owned this property since the mid 1800s. Their name was Putnam. And the Jesuits approached him and said, we're interested in this plot right here, the top of the hill. Um, raised money, bought just 10 acres from Victor Putnam. And by the next summer, they had a little chapel built right on the brow of the hill overlooking the Mohawk Valley, now bucolic and peaceful. And they thought, we're gonna celebrate a mass here on the, on the feast day of Our Lady because it was the eve of that day of the Assumption, August 14th, that Isaac Shog Rene Goupil came up that hill as captives. And we're now going to crown that hill of torture with the Blessed Sacrament. Blessed Sacrament. So on August 15th, 1885, the first Mass was celebrated here, and 4,000 people came. The middle of August, the heat of the summer, with not a stick of shade, but they wanted to be here on this. They knew already. This is holy ground. So that was the beginning of the shrine, which they named Our Lady of Martyrs. It's been called the Shrine of the North American Martyrs for a long time, but it's always really been officially and is known now as the Shrine of Our Lady of Martyrs. So from the 1880s, within about 10 years, they purchased the land that's uh, where the ravine is. They had a, an altar donated that's now down in the ravine with the grotto. Um, that was the first altar. Um, they built the Martyr's Chapel in 1894. So gradually just things kept growing because they could see the interest. By the time of the Martyr's Beatification in 1925, the biggest chapel they had was Our Lady of Martyrs, 
that only made room for 200 people. There were over 10,000 people here the day that they were beatified in Rome. About brought that little chapel down. So in 1930, the ground was broken for the huge Colosseum Church when they were canonized. Somewhere between 35,000 and 50,000 people came to the shrine that day. Phenomenal. And this, the Colosseum began to be built. And it was designed to seat 6,500 people. Um, built round like the Colosseum in Rome to remind us this is martyr's ground, blood was spilt here. And other things kept being added, different statuary, these beautiful seven sorrows of Mary between 1939 and the 1950s were added. Um, the uh, rock rosary to Teresa the Huron girl was added. So little by little and more and more land purchased to keep it big and protected and sanctified. Even, you know, to think that it was built at the beginning of the Great Depression, 1930, 31, that's when that huge church was built. And the, the different um, statues that were added as well. So this has been a, like a work in progress ever since the 1880s, and it, con it continues. The mid 2000 teens, uh, the Jesuits had to make a decision about could we, they continue to do this. Um, as in many orders in the church and many parishes, congregations have fallen off, vocations have fallen off. You know, what are we going to do with the shrine? And it was decided they just couldn't continue with it. And rather than see it closed providentially, as I think we see over and over again with the history of the shrine. Um, Bishop Edward Scharfenberger came into the area when it was, they were saying, I don't think we're gonna be able to do this anymore. And he and some local people started a not-for-profit. Two years later, he presented the deed to the uh, Friends of Our Lady of Martyrs Shrine. So it's now owned and operated by this not-for-profit people see there is a real kind of blossoming with everything from the landscape to the look of the chapels, the Colosseum. It's, we're here through the grace of God and the intercession of the martyrs. So we welcome pilgrimages from all over. Some of the ethnic pilgrimages are coming back. And it's, it's so encouraging to see people recognize the sanctity of this property in the epicenter of the Albany Diocese, but in the, the altar stone of this, of the new world in the Northeast where the martyrs shed their blood, this is where it happened. Significant, significant property. So we're here.